morning, and thank you very much for coming this morning. It's a great pleasure to see you and to welcome you to the Roundhouse. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of context first. My name's Marcus Davey, and I'm the Artistic Director and Chief Executive of the Roundhouse, and um, I'm more than thrilled to welcome you here for the announcement of this new partnership between the Roundhouse and Sir Ken Robinson. Many of you will know the Roundhouse for its performance work. You probably think of it more as a music venue. Um, um, that's something we're completely proud of. You may also know it as a place for spoken word poetry, or for circus, or for theatre, or a whole range of other public art forms. But what you may not be so aware of, some of you will be, is that the Roundhouse is the largest creative centre for young people in Britain, and really the most important multi-arts and media centre for young people in Europe. In the last year, we've worked with 4,500 young people aged 11 to 25. About 55% of those young people are from areas of multiple deprivation and from working class, but also 35% are BME. The great thing is that young people are completely involved in the running of this organisation, from having two young people on the main board of trustees to a youth advisory board that's involved in all the decisions that we make. We feel that there's a great opportunity, and we are so proud, a uh, great opportunity for young people in the future, but we're so proud that we're going to be working with Sir Ken in, in our, on our plans. In a minute, um, I'm going to introduce um, a, a poet. We always have art in everything that we do, and then we'll meet Sir Ken a little bit more uh, in a second. So what I wanted to talk about was that there is a problem out there, and I think we're all aware of it, that um, the a range of arts that are available in schools is diminishing. The opportunities for young people and the perception of the creative subjects by their parents and schools through government policy has become that the creative subjects are not seen as the ones for them to do because it won't lead, they feel, it won't lead to a job. But the amazing thing is that the creative industries are the fastest growing sector of our economy and have been for the last seven years. So there is a complete no-brainer here that by investing in young people to be the creative force and the workforce of the future is the way to go. Also, the creative industries are far more able to adapt to automation of the future, and most of the jobs are actually resilient to automation. So what we've been doing at the Roundhouse since 2006, since we reopened as the art centre that we are today, is investing in 11 to 25-year-olds. For those of you who've not been into the Roundhouse Studios, the Paul Hamlin Roundhouse Studios, we'd be delighted to show you around. 24 state-of-the-art studios where we work in everything from music, poetry, radio, broadcast, and a whole range of other art forms, including circus. Through those activities, we have seen a generation go on to get employment, to go on to back into education. And I'm going to give you two examples. The first is that over the last year, 30 of our young people who've come through Roundhouse Radio, now called Transmission Roundhouse, have gone on to work into the industry, including at Radio 1, 1 Extra, across the platform. Those of young people who have come through the program now in professional jobs. Of the programs that we run each year, there's a range of programs that we work just with young people who are not in employment, education or training, or to use the terrible acronym NEETS. Nobody likes to be called an acronym. But young people are not in employment, education or training. 75% of those young people are going on to education, employment or training through the intensity of the programs that we work with them. And as I said, there is a great opportunity. So over the next five years, we have ambitious plans. We want to increase the numbers of our, the, the young people that we work with from 4,500 to 10,000 young people a year. We also want to open a new centre for young people, a roundhouse centre for creative and digital entrepreneurs. These will be young people aged 18 to 30, where they can develop their businesses, develop their art, and to move on into the creative industries. And in a minute, I'll be talking a little bit more about how we've come into a relationship with Sir Ken. But first, I would like to introduce you to a poet who has come, has been part of the Roundhouse for a few years. And I first saw her when she was on the stage at the Roundhouse, on the main stage, as part of our Poetry Slam final, which is now a big date in the year for spoken word poetry. Please welcome 
Georgie Jones. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm currently a resident artist here, and um, I'm working on a show as part of that. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit from that show uh, now. I've got a confession to make. Uh, I've been staring at the women in the changing rooms in the gym. I know how that sounds, but let me just be very clear about something. I wasn't using the gym. Uh, my flatmate works on the front desk and sneaks me in to sit in the seam room and or sauna. So I'm in the changing room, getting my costume on, hiding in the corner, hoping nobody looks at me, wondering if there's a way I can get my costume on without taking off my jeans. God forbid anybody sees what I've got hiding underneath. I'm mid-manoeuvre, and it's gone a bit wrong. My full coverage costume has turned into a thong. Down below, I've got two legs in the same hole, and up here, my new bracelet has snagged on my old chunky knit. And before I can catch it, my costume starts to slip. I fall forward, elastic pings, knickers and bras fall to the floor with my jeans, and before I know it, I am totally exposed. Completely naked and awkwardly sprawled on the floor of the women's changing rooms at Virgin Active Cricklewood, and... Nobody notices, nobody blinks. They're too busy towel drying freshly showered skin, distracted by nail varnish that's worn too thin, yanking tights over not quite dry thighs. There's one woman in the corner, leg up on a chair, just full on hair drying her pubes, and I can't remember the last time I saw women like this. Post gym, post swim women, out of breath, Hair glued down to sweating heads, post-gym, post-swim women. Rolling bikini bottoms over cellulite and wobbling thighs. I can't remember the last time I saw women like this. Real women. And I don't mean Dove campaign, real women, real women. I mean actual real women. <laughs> women with stretch marks from ankle to thigh with curved bellies and tired eyes, women with leg hair and armpit hair. There are thousands of pubes and lopsided boobs. There are lean thighs that don't touch and then thighs that do. There is acne and back knee and wobbling bums. There are birthmarks and scars and post-school run mums wrangling hordes of goggle-eyed children towards the pool. And of course, I am shocked. Not because of anything these women have or haven't got, but because I can't believe I've never seen this before. I've never seen so much normal. Instead, I've been fed bright-eyed, white-toothed women who pose scantily clad with parenthetical limbs framing slender finger on slender waist, insurmountably symmetrical. And I always thought, if I should have a daughter, what should I teach her? Should I teach her to look at her body in disgust? Draw circles around the worst parts with a fat red pen. Should I teach her to eat less? To try not to be seen? To hide beneath jumpers and oversized jeans? Should I tell her she is less worthy, less beautiful, less valuable because her body doesn't fit the norm? Should I teach her to hate herself, starve herself, paste thin inspiration on her bedroom walls? Excuse me. Um... Track every step. Count every calorie until loose skin surrenders to bone. Should I teach her to fear being out of proportion? To wipe steam from the mirror and see only distortion? To, should I teach her to stare into the mirror until she sees dirt in her freckles? Should I humiliate her in the changing room when we can't fasten clasps or buttons or, zip or zips? Should I scold her over the dinner table when she takes seconds and then stand over her as she bends over the toilet, vomiting up the evidence? Or should I tell her to get herself down to virgin active cricklewood? Tell her my friend can sneak her in. Tell her that's where she'll find real women. That's where she'll learn what beautiful is. Shouldn't we all just be shown more normal? More body, more wobble, more difference, more skin, because that might ease the pressure to try and have to fit in. And I can't remember the last time I saw women like this. And I can't accurately describe how wonderful it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georgie. That's absolutely fantastic. So I think your show is going to be the Last Word Festival, which is our Spoken Word Festival happening in a couple of months' time. Um, the first ever event to happen at the Roundhouse was the launch of the counterculture magazine, the International Times. That happened on the 15th of October, 1966. 
soft machine with a big band of the day, and they performed throughout the evening. And a young, local, unknown band were asked to play um, through an all-night rave, a psychedelic light show. That was Pink Floyd giving their first ever major concert. Ten years, that was really the start of the psychedelia movement. Ten years later, almost to the month, on the 4th of July, 1976, a group of uh, uh, anarchic musicians were in the roundhouse antici anticipating eagerly the arrival of the American band, the Ramones, who gave their first gig here on the 4th of July, 1976, and there we saw the punk movement start. In recent years, we've seen the Roundhouse become a home to the brilliant spoken word, um, to the grime movement, um, I call it a movement, grime music, and we're really proud of everything that happens, and this has come through investing in young people. So what you see on stage and the things that I've just talked about there, those were all musicians and sp spoken word artists under the age of 25. So investing in young people not only gives us great stuff on stage, but it gives the jobs behind the stage as well. I've been a fan and a great admirer of Sir Ken Robinson for about 20 years when I think I first heard of All Our Futures. Since then, I've been an active follower, reading books, watching TED Talks, um, and so much more. And then when I had the opportunity to meet Ken um, and to come to be at the Roundhouse, to show him around the Roundhouse, and for us to start talking about you know, what we love, what we, you know, I was a little bit mute and uh, uh, in awe, I think. I think it's fair to say. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to him um, in a second. Firstly, we are developing a new partnership, and Ken is going to be the Roundhouse, the first ever Roundhouse Associate Creative Curator. I realise that's quite hard to say, <laughs> but it means that we're going to be working together on a whole range of creative ideas with young people but also how our organisation develops to make um, innovation the norm. One of the big parts of this new arrangement and uh, partnership is a new festival, which we haven't got a name for yet, but it's going to be about imagination, creativity and innovation, and will be happening at the beginning of February next year. So it gives me a huge delight, and it's a great honour to welcome Sir Ken Robinson. Is that about right? That's about right. Great stuff. Thank you, Marcus. It is a great honour for the Roundhouse <laughs> to have me here. No, um, I, um, I'm, truthfully, I'm thrilled about this relationship with the Roundhouse for two reasons. One is I've spent my professional life, as it turns out, supporting, advocating and campaigning for the rights of young people, particularly to develop their innate and powerful creative capabilities, not only in the arts, but also in the arts and, and here especially in the arts. I first got involved in all this when, actually when I was at school, uh, when having been uh, implicitly taught that theatre was something that was written down, that we studied as a script, uh, we had a teacher who allowed us to, when I was in the sixth form, to put some plays on, which I did with a group of friends, and I ended up directing them, and it was one of the best experiences I'd ever had, I think we all had. Uh, it, it also was a fantastic benefit to the school. It connected our school, which was a boys' school in Widnes, to the adjacent girls' school, which had all kinds of benefits that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, we were at the Wade Dickin Boys' School, and there was a girls' school across the playground, and we just didn't mix with them. This was in, like, 1967. And I remember we did a production of The Importance of Being Earnest, we wanted to do it anyway, and uh, we asked our head teacher if we could possibly get some girls in it. We had a range of reasons for this, but uh, nobody had ever approached the school, and they said, no, I don't think the girls' school would agree to it. So I remember we crossed the playground to go and see the head teacher, the headmistress of the girls' school, and there were, all the boys were hanging out of the windows in our school, and all the girls were hanging out of the windows of their school. It was like Checkpoint Charlie, <laughs> you know, as we crossed this forbidden land. 
And the head teacher was thrilled. She said, absolutely. So we put this play on. It was the first kind of mixed gender play that we'd put on. And it was a fantastic success. And I went on from that uh, to train as an English and drama teacher. And I did a lot of research into why drama seemed not to have its proper place in the school curriculum when it was self-evidently so important to so many people. For all the reasons people still talk about. You know, politicians these days continue to talk about the importance of promoting um, communication skills, collaboration, cooperation. Davos recently, the World Economic Forum published a report about the, the, the importance of these skills in the 21st century economies. You know, the argument for this stuff isn't just economic, but there's also an economic argument for it. Um, and then, you know, I, I studied this stuff at college and, you know, qualified to teach English and drama and then went on to do a lot of research into it and, and why the arts generally don't occupy the place they self-evidently should in our schools. I think there are two reasons for it. One of them is that our schools are dominated by a particular conception of intelligence, uh, particularly academic work, which is inherently suspicious of practical activities. Uh, it's why, for example, there's this apartheid in the school system between academic and vocational programs. They're always seen as kind of second tier. Even when we had this wonderful array of polytechnics in this country before the unification of the, th of the tertiary sector, polytechnics were also seen as somehow second rate to research-led universities. It's kind of in the cultural bloodstream that that's the situation. And also, uh, there's a fear of feeling in the system. Um, that's, we owe this in part to the Enlightenment, and for all its great gifts to, to Western culture. Nonetheless, there is a sense that somehow feelings are disruptive. If you look at psychology, the history of psychology is what Ardy Lang once called a negative psychology of affect. There's an awful lot about the negative impact of feeling, of emotional disturbance, of emotional illness, and very little in the literature about the real benefits of positive feelings like joy and exhilaration and pleasure and aesthetics. It's beginning to shift a little bit, by the way, with the positive psychology movement. But, However, there are reasons why uh, the arts are, are always on the margins. The second reason is that uh, we still believe... <laughs> Thank you very much. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was everything. What just happened? Are we all dead? <laughs> what? Interfeed. Sensational, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Does anybody want to leave and get cleaned up? Anything? <laughs> um. Oh, yeah. There was, <laughs> there was another reason. I'll speak quickly, shall I? <laughs> because we don't know if we're going to get out of here alive. <laughs> the other reason is that people insist on this idea that there's a kind of straight line between what people study in school, what the world needs, and what they will go on to do. I published a book a number of years ago called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. And it's about how finding your passion changes everything. <laughs> I'm <laughs> rather good at titles. and. It's based on, uh, it's a pretty simple observation, truthfully, which is that there are all kinds of people who uh, really don't enjoy the work they do or the lives they lead uh, and don't often believe they have any special talents or abilities. And yet, I also meet people who love what they do and they couldn't really imagine doing anything else. If you were to say to them, you know, why, why don't you change track? They'd say, well, why would I? This isn't what I do. This is who I am. And they can be in any form of occupation or professional life or non-professional life that you care to name. They could be journalists. They could be writers, dancers, musicians, scientists, mathematicians, or none of the above. They could be working in uh, office jobs. They could be homemakers. If you can think of any form of human activity in life, there will be people who love it and people who couldn't bear to do it for five minutes. It's one of the great hallmarks of humanity that we are characterized by diversity just like the rest of the, human wo the, rest of the natural world. And if you ask people how you got to do what you do now, very few people have followed a straight line to get to it. They've gone through all kinds of zigzags and uh, very few people, I mean, I've asked whole audiences about, about this across the world, you know, did you know when you were 15 what you'd be doing now with your life? Of course, people don't. What you do become in your life has everything to do with whether or not you discover your talents, your abilities, and the opportunities you take or move away from. 
So the role of general education is not to provide some kind of half cock vocational preparation for lives that people are not likely to lead or which, which you can't predict in any case. And yet, that is kind of what permeates the system. If you look at the priorities, for example, in the, in the new EBAC in this country or in most uh, education systems in the West, you'll see there's a priority given to uh, disciplines which are thought to have a more utilitarian value, like the STEM disciplines. The STEM disciplines are tremendously important. But it doesn't follow that people will go on to work in those areas. I mean, for example, every child in the country at the moment is required to study mathematics to a high level. But nobody's assuming that all are going to be mathematicians. There's an assumption that these things will be of some value to them in, in terms of the overall training and you know, educational preparation it gives them. So the arts are also sidelined because people will then say, it's not just about the intellectual conception of the art, but they will say, well, there's no point in doing music, you're not going to be a musician. Or you won't, there's no point in doing dance, you won't be a dancer. But I say, nobody's expecting mathematicians to all become statisticians. So there's, a, there's another prejudice built in. Now, these aren't new arguments. Um, there was a, I wrote a report uh, with others for the Gulbenkian Foundation in 1982 called The Arts and Schools, which was in the run-up to the national curriculum at the time. This was before we had a national curriculum. It came out in 82. The current national curriculum came out in 1988. And you'll recall it was introduced by a, a conservative government under Margaret Thatcher and Kenneth Baker. And we anticipated correctly the arts would not be given uh, much of a, a shot in this curriculum. Actually, art and music were, but the performing arts, not so well, drama and dance, not so much. So that report came out, but I quoted in that report a previous conference that had happened where Sir Herbert Reed had spoken very eloquently about the importance of the arts in the context of uh, rapid technological change that was sweeping the country. It was called Education, Humanity and Technology. It was a conference at the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, and you could read it now, and it would be as if he'd given the speech today. But this was in 1959. And at the time, the government was being urged of the day to, off to operate a much broader approach to education priorities and to recognize the inherent importance of cultural programs, the arts in particular, but also the many ways in which the arts intersect with technology, with science, and broader social and cultural developments. Then, in, 1990, in 1997, I chaired a commission for the Labour government then, for uh, Tony Blair and David Blunkett. It was called All Our Futures, Creativity, Culture and Education, which is what Marcus talked about, where we talked not just about the arts, but the need for a more creative approach to the whole of education, science, technology, the whole thing. And yet, here we are, you know, 20 years on, having the same conversation. And honestly, it's hard to fathom why we still have this conversation when the benefits of these rigorous, disciplined programs are self-evident to anyone who's had any direct experience of them. Time and again, Marcus gives examples, but I live in the United States now. Uh, actually, I live in Los Angeles, which is not strictly the same thing. Uh, but <laughs> it's a short plane ride, you know, from LA to America. Uh, I've, I've been there for 17 years, but we are, uh, I haven't uh, gone public on this yet. I suppose I am about to, aren't I? But we are heading back uh, at some point quite soon. Uh, but we've been there for 17 years, and I, I get to travel across America very extensively. I get to travel uh, in, in many different parts of the world, Australia, Asia. You know where the world is, don't you? <laughs> there. There. All that stuff. Um, these aren't issues unique to the UK. These are issues which are embedded in the dominant conceptions of education, but they are beginning to shift. Uh, under the Obama administration, there was a report called uh, the, uh, the imp I think it's called the, uh, the, imp the, the Place of the Arts and Humanities in Education. It was the President's Commission. And they gave endless examples of how a, a properly conceived, rigorous program of uh, education in the arts can benefit all children in all communities. The Teacher of the Year, who's just been announced in Dubai, uh, has been fated for having a remarkable impact on the lives of young people in a difficult, culturally complex part of this city. And she has been properly recognized for the transformative work she's been doing there. She's an art and design teacher. And she's brought these changes about through the rigors of, the, of her discipline and her cultural sensitivity to the students' backgrounds and interests that she works with. This is what happens with great arts programs. This is what's been happening here at the Roundhouse. So the trick, I th there's a couple of things here I just want to say. One is that this work is self-evidently important. There's copious evidence to support the idea of it. There are numerous examples. I published a book a few years ago called Creative Schools where we gave lots of examples. I've just published a book for parents called You, Your Child and School, which gives even more of them. The Roundhouse has you know, ledgers full of transformative stories of young people 
and how the arts have changed their lives. The work is vital and essential. And that's why I've been involved in it for so long. Not in opposition to science or anything else, but for a more holistic view of young people and the lives they lead. It's becoming even more important. As economic changes and cultural changes sweep over us, this sort of work is becoming more urgent and not less. So I was delighted when I met Marcus here uh, to talk about the work that's been going on here for a long time. You know, the Roundhouse is known for its, uh, as he said, you know, its pioneering work as a music venue. I first came here in 1972 when this was before I was distinguished. <laughs> before I was a distinguished person that stands before you right now. Um, at the time, uh, I was living in a squat in Euston. Lovely squat. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. And we had furbished it to a very high level. But uh, I was here doing um, a postgraduate degree at the Institute of Education. I used to come and hang out here quite a bit. I saw a lot of the early performances here. I, mean, I wasn't here when it first launched. It was, was it 66 when this was sent to 42 when Arnold Wesso got involved in it. But the Roundhouse has always been part of the social and cultural agenda of this country. So I came here in 72. I saw uh, the Grand Magic Circus. I think Moving Being performed here a lot, the National Theatre. It's a storied place. What I didn't know is just how thoroughly and wholeheartedly the Roundhouse has been committed to the creative development of young people for so long. If you have a tour around the building, you'll see an extraordinary array of studios downstairs as well. I remember when I first came here, uh, Marcus was talking about the kind of interactions that happened here. and he was t I think you were telling me about some kids who were downstairs rehearsing a few years back. And uh, he said, how did it go on? He said, it was great. Uh, some old guy came in and sat with us for a bit. Were you telling me? Or was it one of the parents? Some old guy came in and sat down. He helped us with some songs. And he said, oh, really? How was that? He said, oh, it was nice. It was good. It was good. It was, it was quite useful. And he said, do you remember who he was? He said, I don't know, Paul McCarthy? Mc <laughs> said, McCartney? Yes, Paul McCartney. That's right. He kind of came in and kind of interfered with the creative process for a bit. And he said, he's a nice guy, you know, getting on a bit, obviously. <laughs> but he, I think, was performing here at the time at, uh, uh, at the... Uh, I, th I think probably the BBC proms. And what I'm saying is this has always been a fantastic crucible of creative work. So we began to talk about ways we could work together. And that's what we're now doing. Uh, it's a, a nice title to give me, but thank you. I'd, I'd have come anyway. But, uh, but what we want to do is to bring together our various expertise and areas of interest and passion to help devo develop the Roundhouse's program even more thoroughly in the years ahead. And one of the ideas we have is this creative festival, which will be happening uh, in next February, all being well. But, you know, there'll be other ideas that we'll be coming up with as well. We want to do a couple of things. One is, this is meant to be a practical program to support young people, not to proselytise about it, but to support them, to give them opportunities and to showcase what they are capable of doing and for it to act as a catalyst for more people to do it who aren't necessarily in this direct region. I think there's an opportunity here to use this as a way of catalyzing the international conversation. And there's great work happening all over the world, as you know. But we also do want to promote it. We want to give a fuller account of why it matters and to give lots of examples of how it works. So we're delighted you came today because it's important as part of this national conversation. I always want to say to politicians, by the way, the change doesn't happen from the top down. Uh, I never sit around waiting for politicians to get this. There's no point. Uh, some do, some don't. It's like everybody else. And uh, real change happens from the ground up when people feel it's right and ready and the energy is, is big enough. I mean, look what's happening at the moment with the Me Too movement. You know, the post-Florida shootings with Parkland. You know, when people feel the time is right, they'll move, and they will. And this work has always had a great deal of energy behind it. At the same time, I think it's important if we can persuade our policymakers and funders of the importance of this work, then we really should, because it needs support, it needs funding, and it needs facilities. And the irony, of course, is this is a gift. This is a gift. Politicians around the world, governments are all saying we need to look again at the nature of education given the extraordinary cultural and economic changes that are sweeping across the planet. All the things people hope for are the things that get promoted by these sorts of programs. This isn't a problem, it's a solution. And we want the solution to be more widely understood and more widely promoted. So thank you, Marcus, for the opportunity. I'm thrilled to be here, and I shall be here often. Thank you. So um, thank you very much, Ken. And any questions from anybody um, before we have a performance to finish with at the end? What is wrong with you, honestly? <laughs> so demanding. <laughs> um, 
Uh, it's beginning to shape up. It's going to be, we're planning at the moment in February as a three day event. Uh, there will be uh, probably a series, we think probably six to eight kind of landmark events during the course of it. We'll be showcasing existing work, we'll be commissioning fresh work, so there'll be performances in the main auditorium. Uh, there'll be workshops and exhibitions around the building and hopefully around the, the broader area. We don't want this to be confined to the Roundhouse, but it'll be centred on the Roundhouse, so we're looking to work in partnership with other cultural organisations in the area. And there will at some point, we think, be some kind of symposium. It may be half a day. Um, I'm very keen to say this isn't, uh, this isn't conceived as a conference, but we think at some point there should be an opportunity for people to get together and talk about what, what's all, what all this is about and why it matters so much. But it's, it's our first uh, event and we're shaping it now, but it will be performances, workshops, exhibitions, yes, and, and some, some opportunity to talk about why it all matters. One of the things that I'm hoping to do is a, an evening uh, based on the book I did, The Element. We're calling it uh, The Night of the Element. Not with a K, with a, just like, <laughs> Night of the Element. Uh, because the, the element is full of great examples of people's non-linear lives and how they got to discover the thing they, they do best and that they love to do. And so we want to bring together people from around London to get them to come and tell their stories and share it with young people and um, put it together as a night's entertainment. So uh, a number of those. Is there anything else you'd add, Marcus? Yes. Um, and I should say that this is the beginning of the relationship. This is an initial five-year period that we've uh, kind of agreed between us. So the, the first iteration will be, you know, the first iteration. It'll move from there. We'll see how it develops, see how audiences uh, respond and see if we're getting the, the impact and the, the message across. Any other questions? Dan. You mentioned earlier, you mentioned earlier an increase of... Four and a half thousand young people here every year to ten thousand. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the funding and where those people, where those children are coming from? Their local schools. Yeah. What's the sort of the criteria for people coming in to, to take advantage of that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, until a couple of years ago, we were working with around three thousand young people a year. And the most important thing for us is the depth of the relationship we have with those young people that we work with. It can't just be a, a fleeting one, it needs to be a quality relationship to have the most impact. Um, so it, we built up to about four and a half thousand and to get to that 10,000 figure, we're gonna need to work in partnership with others around London. Um, at the moment, the, the, those that come and take part in the programme come from all over London. In fact, it stretches out a little bit further and that we have international programmes and you know there, there are programmes with partners around the country as well. But it's mainly London and um, so the answer to that is we'll, we have plans to have our new centre for creative and digital entrepreneurs which will increase those numbers and a new building which will have some bigger studios so we can have more young people on site because actually we're kind of squeak, you know, pressurised at the edges of the studios that we have at the moment. So looking to work more in partnership around London. How's that funded? Um, as uh, a, the Roundhouse is, has very, um, a, a, a really you know, interesting matrix of how it is um, funded from the commercial work that we do to the um, fundraising that we do to the public funding. The public funding is about 8%. Um, and everything else we build on top of that. So yes, we will need to have more activity, and to fund that fund that activity, we need more funders, donors, um, public support, and um, any other commercial activity that we can develop. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about that. So you're going to have a new centre, perhaps you built in the. Sorry, you're going to have a new centre built in the car park, or so you know? we ha we are developing plans for that at the moment. Yeah. I have to excuse the very localised question. I'm from the Camden New Journal, so <laughs> that's. <Yeah. it. laughs> And we love you. <laughs> love you too. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll give you my number at the end. You know. <laughs> You've got it already. <laughs> I think we might do. Sorry. And yeah, I also wanted to ask about the, the new centre that you mentioned. Is this, is this the first time you're kind of announcing this? And what's the kind of time scale? And can you talk a little bit more about your plans for that? Uh, I can tell you a little bit, which is that as we are pressurised with the studios that we have at the moment, and we've never had some big studios, we need some big studios where we can work with, say, the Roundhouse Choir, the Music Collective, with our circus programme, um, but also this new Centre of Creative Entrepreneurs. So we have some plans, which um, we've got planning permission already. We haven't publicly announced them yet, and there will be a full public announcement of those in due course, um, but that is one of the ways that we want to... Um, 
and enlarge the program that we do, but also enable us to do some more large scale work as well. Simon. Um, I don't know if you know about the Creative Industries Federation, but they've organized what seems to me to be a rather desperate letter to the Telegraph today about creative education. Um, are you saying here that you've given up on creative education in schools now? It could only really happen, uh, vital as it is, outside of schools in this kind of scheme, funded not by the state but by philanthropy and private giving. Is that what, is that what this is really is? Uh, uh, a, a way mark for? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you want a longer answer? <laughs> well, I do no, want it's a longer not, answer no. because the, the, yeah. the, 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 the difficulty is that yes. creative education is not happening and whatever, however big the creative industries are becoming, the, however fast growing they are, however yeah. you know, powerful soft power is, doesn't seem to be making any difference to those who plan our education cur curriculum. Well, I, th I think there's, there's a distinction to be drawn, isn't there? But, but the, the direct answer to your question is no, I, I've not given up on, uh, on the sort of work I'm concerned with and promoting, and not, not just me, but lots of other people. I'm not giving up on that happening in schools. Uh, there are fantastic schools everywhere. We had a great meeting this morning with a group of students from Highgate and from Tottenham, and they have wonderful teachers, and they're doing really interesting work, and there are schools all over the country doing great work. Uh, the trouble is, though, as you imply, it's happening in spite of dominant policies, not because of them. And uh, this was true when we did the All Our Futures report in 1990, well, it came out in 1999, that uh, we were saying there's a massive opportunity here uh, because of the shifts in the economy, uh, because of the cultural complexity of the lives people are leading. There's a manifest social need for kids to become more constructively and creatively engaged in the determination of their own lives. I mean, it's very hard to draw straight lines here, you know, but I was reading a piece at the uh, over the weekend, which was suggesting that you know some of the violence that's been happening in London latterly, you know, is coming out of frustration at some of the you know the cultural conditions that people live in. Well, education is Im Im implicated in all of this. It's not the solution to all of it, but it has to create the context for this. So no, I, I've spent my life working with schools and school school systems and school districts, and there is wonderful work going on. The problem consistently has been through one administration after another, is to get. Uh, our policy makers to understand the need for this sort of dynamic and for balance. And, you know, the, 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 um, it was interesting to me, you know, that this, this teacher who came back from Dubai, properly fated, you know, was welcomed back by senior politicians who are promoting policies which are inimical to the work she's actually been successful doing. And, you know, I, I suppose I was, I was rather shocked, honestly, that politicians might say one thing and do something else, you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why I still cling to this belief they might be consistent. But no, I don't give up on that. And, and also because the real, shifts is ha the real shift tends to happen from the ground up. And I always encourage people to keep going with this because there are big changes happening. Universities are having to reconfigure themselves. More and more employers are, are standing up and saying, look, this system isn't working for us either. Uh, parents, you know, at the last weekend have been pushing back against the SATs and the pressures of testing. Um, it's a complex picture here, but I am convinced the priorities of the current system are misconceived for the complexity of the times that we live in. They always were, truthfully, but increasingly I think it's important that teachers and schools and head teachers push back against this along with parents. But there was, there was always a role for the cultural sector to work in partnership with schools, always. You know, the great cultural organizations in this country have always done that, you know, from the Roundhouse, the Royal Opera House, the National Theatre, and on and on. There's always a role for artists and other professionals to be involved in schools and to work in partnership with them. When we did um, All Our Futures, we had a whole chapter on creative partnerships, and that led to a national program. Uh, there's always a role for, you know, employers to get involved and to support programs, just as there is in apprenticeships. So, so education shouldn't be confined to schools. Uh, I think it's more likely as these changes happen outside the system, it will encourage changes within. But it's equally important the changes happen inside. Well, it's, yeah, it is. It, it, it can be glacial. But along the way, there's great work going on. As somebody once said, I always forget who to attribute the quote to, but somebody once said that the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I should say, Simon, we're absolutely passionate about encouraging work in schools, and we work with a lot of schools at the Roundhouse. We are absolutely passionate that every young person gets a creative education, and that we're not trying to do the alternative, we're trying to do something in addition to. And the most important thing, the starting point, is that creative subjects are available to every single young person in school. So that's our starting point.
Any, any final questions? No, in that case, uh, we're going to vacate the stage and we're going to welcome a brilliant young poet um, who's been with us since 2015. Um, so please thank Sir Ken and also welcome Sugar Jay. Hello. Oh, wow. I was talking to myself. Hi. Hey, look at that. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm going to do a poem for you. Um, and yeah, thank you um, just for everything that was said as well. I think it's really important um, as a young person and as someone with like younger siblings as well. Um, yeah, creativity is so important. Um, and I think it is, it is overlooked a lot. I think that we should start holding funerals for people before they die. There's a time to mourn, and as tears adorn our face, yes, we should remember the dead. But wouldn't it be best if these words were given whilst the soul could still taste them? If friends turn out in mass whilst the heart could still laugh and reminisce? If I could... I'd hold funerals for those I love before they hit the grave. I'd make speeches stemming from the root of my affection, blossoming into odes about how I didn't want them to leave. There would be food and jubilation, a memory wall full of things our minds could barely contain. Not one friend would refrain from pinning up a memory. It's funny how many ears remain dull to the voice of a living friend, but will hear the silent call of a dead man. Love should be declared before anyone is lowered into the ground. Let no good thing remain on your tongue unsaid. This I refuse to do. Obituaries won't be written, rather will reminisce on the times that I said all that I love about you. I'll say soppy things, cringy poet things like, you are the star in my night sky that illuminates life. I won't just be sweet with you. I'll tell you how you suck too. Like, would it kill you to throw your tea bags away? <laughs> I don't know exactly everything I'd say, but I'm acutely aware that every year that passes is like a knell signaling my death day. So I think we should start holding funerals for people before they die to make sure we give our best to them whilst they're alive. Thank you. Uh, great thanks to both our performers today, to Sir Ken Robinson, but most importantly to thank you for coming today and uh, being part of this journey that we're all going on. Thank you for coming today and there's, I think there's more bits and bobs to drink and eat at the back if you'd like to stay longer. Thank you very much. <laughs>